Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in today's video we're going to be exploring the hypothetical idea of our sun being a red dwarf. So what if our beautiful sun actually was a red dwarf? What would our solar system be like and what would the planets around it be like as well? Let's find out in this video and welcome to Water Math. <laughs> And so we're actually going to be using Universe Sandbox Square for this particular simulation. And what we're going to be doing is changing our sun from the uh, type of a star that it is right now, which is uh, known as a yellow main sequence star, or sometimes known as an orange main sequence star, also known as Spectro Type G2, to a red dwarf. Like, for example, this one right here, Wolf 359. This is a red main um, sequence dwarf, uh, M type star which has a much, much smaller mass and also is a lot less luminous as well. Now, we don't really need to change the mass for this, though. So let me just actually show you what we're going to be creating in comparison to our sun. Let's place the sun right here. And let's actually place uh, maybe Wolf and a few other stars that are red dwarfs very, very close to it. So we can actually compare them in terms of size. I'm actually going to place uh, the recently discovered Trappist here as well because it's probably one of the most uh, popular red dwarfs right now. Now let's look at how they compare to each other in terms of the size. And so here we are. This is our sun and this is the red dwarf right here. The uh, second closest red dwarf to us, Bernard Star, is relatively large for a red dwarf but it's much 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 smaller than our sun and Trappist 1 is one of the smallest stars we've discovered. It's it's basically about 8% mass of our sun and it's a lot less luminous. It's also a lot, a lot less hot and produces a lot less um, heat as well. So in comparison to our sun, for example, where the surface temperature is uh, 57 degrees, 5700 degrees Kelvin, the temperature on Trappist is only about 50, uh, 2500 degrees Kelvin, which is about half of that on the sun, or in terms of Celsius, this is just over 2200 degrees. Um, so it's, these stars are a lot cooler, they're also a lot, a lot less luminous. The luminosity here is like 3000 times less that, uh, than that of the sun, and so obviously these stars don't produce as much energy as well. And this is what we're going to be making from our sun. And let's see what happens when we go to the solar system simulation and start modifying our sun. So first of all, let's actually lock the mass here because we don't really need to change the mass. Mass is not important, but we do need to change the radius and we do need to change everything else. And the reason I'm locking the mass is because I actually want all of my planets to stay in the same orbit. And the orbit is strictly mass dependent, so it will uh, basically not change anything else. So here, let's start with changing the radius. We know that the radius of a typical um, red dwarf star is uh, somewhere around 60 to maybe 90,000 kilometers. So they're much, much smaller. We're going to make this as small as, let's say, Trappist. It's about 70, 79,000 kilometers. So this is about size of Trappist-1. We're also going to decrease the temperature to about 2200 something degrees Celsius and uh, luminosity. And with these parameters, we have now turned our beautiful sun into a typical red dwarf. So this is what sun as a red dwarf would look like. As you can see, none of the orbits around it changed because we didn't change the mass of this object. And, but you'll notice that it's actually moving now. So if I were to accelerate time, you would see that it's actually kind of orbiting. It's creating um, a kind of a circle around um, uh, an imaginary spot in the middle. And that's because of Jupiter. Jupiter actually has a berry center with our sun. And this berry center can be seen if I were to select sun and Jupiter, then right click on them and do this right here, create berry center. So now somewhere in the middle here, right around there is the berry center of our sun jupiter system so now sun actually is moving around unlike in the previous uh simulation where sun was big enough that the berry center was actually inside of it so let's actually now take a look at the planet so we're gonna run this for a few years and take a look at all of the planets how they've actually transformed 
And specifically here, I really want to see if any of these planets that we have uh, here will actually be habitable or will have any potential for uh, liquid water. Now, first of all, let's take a look at the habitable zone that we've created for this particular star. I'm going to go under view and click zones and you'll see that the habitable zone for this star is very, very close to it. It's actually only about a million or so kilometers away. So if I were to place a planet in this habitable zone, its actual orbital period would be about four and a half days. So this is kind of similar to what it's like around TRAPPIST-1 system, where all of the planets in the habitable zone have their year between one and a half to about maybe six days. So this is essentially the new habitable zone, but nothing is in this zone. Mercury is right outside of it, meaning that even Mercury that used to be super, super hot is now at chilling minus 187 degrees Celsius. Earth, this is an ice ball. Earth is ridiculously cold. It's uh, It actually cooled down within about five years after I changed the sun. And the temperature here is minus 126 degrees Celsius. Everything else will obviously be just as cold. And I'm going to take a look at the planet that gives me hope. There's only one planet that might still give us hope because everything else here is super, super cold. These were cold to begin with, but now they're even colder than before. Now, the planet I'm, I'm thinking of is, of course, Venus. Before we changed the sun, due to the proximity to the sun and due to the fact that Venus has like 92 atmospheres of pressure on its surface, the temperature on Venus was close to about 500 degrees Celsius. It was about 460 something. Now, it is still cold. It's actually minus 124. So even Venus, the planet that I was hoping would be terraformed now, is also very, very chilly. So the actual greenhouse effect that's about 110 degrees here is still not enough to warm up this planet very much. The effective temperature, or basically the equilibrium temperature in this particular area, is minus 234. So add 110 to it and you'll get about minus 124. There is a way to maybe solve this. And that's, of course, by moving Venus a little bit closer. So maybe if Venus were orbiting a little bit closer, like if it had the orbit of Mercury, for example, which means that this will be 85 days. Uh, in this case, maybe, just maybe, it will go up just enough. But maybe not. It's actually only going to go up to about minus 80 degrees still. So we need to place even Venus much, much closer to this particular um, red dwarf for this particular planet to be habitable. So let's actually move Venus back to where it used to be for a second and talk about, is there anything else we can do to terraform at least one of these planets in this new red dwarf sun system? Because there's actually, there, there's quite, quite a high possibility that there might be um, solar systems out there that actually do have a red dwarf star and have a bunch of um, planetary objects similar to Earth orbiting around them in a far, far away distance similar to what we've created here. So, what can we do to Venus? Well, first of all, one of the reasons why Venus is not any more hot than it already is is because it has a very high reflectivity. It's actually almost like a mirror. It reflects a lot of stuff. Um, specifically, it reflects a lot of heat. That's the albedo here. If we somehow change the reflectivity of Venus, specifically by removing a lot of the chemicals from its atmosphere that also make it very toxic, we can reduce this to something similar to about 20%. This is actually a lot more similar to some of the asteroids and a lot more similar to some of the rocks in our solar system. So Mars, for example, has a bit of about 0.25. So let's maybe just make it a little bit lower than that. That already gave us a huge boost in greenhouse effect. We're now down to about minus 40 degrees Celsius. That's already much, much, much better. And if on top of that, we found a way to release some of the other uh, materials from Venus' uh, surface, basically, if we were to increase the surface pressure even a little bit higher to maybe about 150 atmospheres. And here we go. So at around 170 atmospheres of pressure, which is about double what it used to be, we were able to reach the surface temperature that is a lot more comfortable. Now, we need to get uh, water to Venus, so we're maybe we'll just take a few asteroids from the uh, asteroid belt and then basically collide those asteroids with Venus, bringing water to it. Now, with water, we'll have 
a potential to terraform this planet now. That's actually an explosion much larger than I expected it to be. But anyway, so this will bring water and very likely um, initiate a lot of various reactions on the surface, some of which might be actually beneficial to our terraforming project. And at this point, now that we actually have water on the surface and the temperature is a little bit more comfortable, this may look like... Yeah, there we go. It's terraformed Venus. It has liquid water, a uh, few spots left from the collisions, and basically this here is the surface that can be terraformed. The only problem, of course, is that the surface pressure here is 180 atmospheres, but hopefully by then we'll remove all of the toxic elements in, in Venus' atmosphere that would stop us from basically uh, uh, living here. Now, with um, this surface pressure, it would be very difficult for us to... Uh, live on the surface without using some sort of a pressurized uh, vehicles. But the thing is, human beings can actually survive very, very, very high surface pressures. As a matter of fact, that's how, how scuba diving works. You can scuba dive pretty deep. The record so far is over 300 meters deep in the water. The only problem is that, of course, you need to r find the right mixture of gases. Um, and you have to obviously take breaks once in a while. But, you know, in a few generations of people living on this planet, they can actually get used to this. And eventually, we as long as there's oxygen here, we might actually be able to adapt to this type of environment. So, with double the surface pressure... And with reducing albedo and removing all of the toxic elements from the uh, Venusian atmosphere, we were actually able to create a terraformed Venus, which I'm going to re rename now, around this tiny, tiny red dwarf of the sun. Now, to me, this gives us hope. And the hope is that maybe those planets that we'll discover around TRAPPIST-1 or other planets that we we'll actually will discover in the future around various red dwarfs might have thick enough atmosphere to actually be able to sustain um, a very terra-like environment or terraformed environment, the environment that where we'll be actually able to live. Many of these planets will most likely be tidally locked, uh, but if they have thick enough atmosphere, they'll have a very good gas exchange going on, just like there is on the surface of Venus. So they won't actually have to, or we won't actually have to worry about these planets being too hot or too cold. So. Of all these stars out there, there's definitely going to be at least one that's going to look very similar to this terraformed Venus, where we might be actually able to live. And, well, you know what? That's all I wanted to say in this video. I just wanted to see if we could create... And, well, you know what? That's really all I wanted to say in this video. I wanted to create a system with a red dwarf sun just to see what would happen and see if I could actually terraform at least one planet to make it habitable, just to give us hope for the future when we discover various red dwarfs with various planets around them. Hopefully you enjoyed this video, and if you did, don't forget to subscribe and maybe share this video with someone who enjoys learning through video games, or someone who likes space stuff, or someone who likes science stuff. Anyway, come back here tomorrow because I'm going to talk about something a little bit different and you're going to learn something else. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Space out. And as always, bye-bye. And Venus, I'm really sorry, but I always wondered what would happen if I actually press this button called explode and clicked on it and then clicked on you. Oh, well, that's interesting. That's kind of like in Star Wars. Not as dramatic, though.